Okay, everyone. Oh, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is the Troll Working Group. Uh, I'm John. This is Sue. We are the co-chairs, Donald's secretary, and for the rest of the week, uh, Ted, who we love very much, is our air director. Uh, note well, should be read, respected, and understood. If you have any questions, please come to us and let us know. So looking at the agenda, we are going to go over some administrative stuff, uh, document status, and then we'll get into uh, some of the drafts we, have, uh, we get to present today. This will go into a little more detail on directory assistance, some arborage channel tunnel, uh, tree selection, and uh, a revision of the appointed goal order. Uh, there will also be some, uh, it, hopefully, an interesting discussion on security and some other drafts we get some updates on. You want to cover documents now? Okay. Um, as you see, we've gone through and uh, there are several mandatory RFCs. You'll see that we've been working at uh, BISs later. And I think I'll go through that. Um, 
you'll notice we have a 7180 BIS coming up in the future. These are other uh, standards track optional RFCs that you've seen and uh, drafts for PPP and Trill. All of this should be just if you've never seen Trill before or been to our working groups, these are all the rest necessary RFCs. We thought this time we might see some routing folks. Uh, these are informational and now we have the expert review. We have an OEM draft in MIB review, even though all you've heard this week is Yang. Uh, we've requested um, publication uh, for the active-active drafts, uh, Trill AA Mocha Attach, uh, Trill CMT, and pseudo nickname. I did, uh, we were discussing as you came in that uh, RFC 71 BIS uh, is in the process of being requested by the ISG. Um, there's a few more steps as we enter into the routing area, so I've worked on those. Uh, please read the drafts that are currently in progression. Uh, we're going to move uh, the directory uh, um, drafts and the Yang drafts fairly quickly, so we'd appreciate any reading, also any of the replication. And our major priorities are, again, try to get the OEM working, try to get the Yang there so people can actually uh, manage boxes, try to finish our active-active work, try to get our directory assistance. And we've completed a lot of our milestones. Um, the only thing that we're overdue on is the trill over IP to the ISG. Questions about where we're going? Okay. Future milestones, I think we've mentioned where we're going with them. If there's any questions on how we're working through this, please let me know. Or John, or Donald. Whoever you feel comfortable with, come up and chat with. Okay, okay we're done. And so. This is this is set up for tall speakers. I mean, I I'm not terribly short. I, I, <laughs> uh, so actually, there's a, several short uh, presentations at the beginning here. One status, which uh, so anyway, so active active status. So so active active. People hopefully know about that. The idea is to take the rapid failover and. Uh, traffic spreading based on a per flow basis that you can do inside the Trill campus and extend it to um, various forms of end stations or bridges or whatever that are multiply connected uh, to a set of edge switches. Uh, obviously more than one, could be two, three, four or more, whatever. Uh, next slide. So uh, there's an RFC out, 7379, which will tell you what the problem statement is. and. Uh, gives the goals for active active so in the looking into this we found three alternative ways of doing this the initial concentration was on this pseudo nickname where the higher group of edge R bridges besides having individual nicknames there's also a, a single nickname that sort of represents that edge group and uh, lets you ingress things as from the edge group and throughout send them out to that edge group there's also a technique too where you could assign different our bridges at the edge to handle different uh, ranges of MAC addresses or other kinds of funny things, even ones in odd MAC addresses or something like that. Um, and and that, that way they could ingress things using their own nickname and you get back to the right one, but because uh, of the way Active Active works, which is frequently an MC lag kind of thing, uh, frequently outgoing frame would get to the wrong R bridge. You'd have to tunnel it to the right one. And it's got a lot of, uh, so anyway, we decided not to do that. Three is one where you do have the edge R bridges uh, ingress using their own nickname, and you may get things from the same source MAC to the same destination MAC, which have different ingress R bridges. And if you try to do data plane learning, that tends to cause flip-flopping and unhappiness, but there's other ways to do that. So we're progressing both the uh, pseudonode nickname and the uh, multi-attach, where basically you handles it by turning off the uh, data plane learning and using Isadi, so you can actually see all the multiple attachments in the control plane and uh, send traffic back to whichever is, is the closest one in the edge bridge. Next slide. 
So this gives a little bit more on the, the drafts. The pseudonode nickname draft is uh, the active active edge group. That's what AAE stands for. Um, it's represented by this pseudo nickname. And the advantage of this is that you don't need to change anything at the remote trill switches. Only the edge group needs to kind of understand this, but the entire campus has to support this coordinated multicast trees or support centralized replication. So you got to, there's a problem which I don't want to go into the details related to the reverse path forwarding check. So the coordinated multicast trees, actually you can do several things with it, but one of the things it does is it solves this reverse path forwarding check for pseudo nickname. And then AA multiple attach is this other method where you have the active active edge group ingress under their own nicknames. And this uh, can be done with, so with no changes at the remote R bridges, uh, remote tool switches, but they have to support ISADI, which is optional. Next slide. So there's a centralized replication draft. Uh, I don't know if it's quite as far along. It has certainly been uh, in the working group less, uh, not as long. And uh, there's also this RFC 7180 bis, so but there's no presentation on that here. Uh, but uh, it adds support for these uh, extended level one flooding scope LSPs. Basically, it's, it incorporates an optional extension to ISIS, which gives you lots more uh, space for link state and uh, various things like that. So it's, it, it's used by the other drafts. Next slide. So this is the dependency chart. <laughs> uh, so the AA multi-attach and the pseudonode nickname, which is sort of the, the real solution drafts, they're both dependent on this 7180 bis. And the pseudonode nickname, as I say, for the RPF check solution re requires that you either do CMT or centralized replication. CMT has been a working group draft for a long time. It's getting on quite a while. So that's basically all the ones with the double frame here are planned is to request publication. That's actually been requested for these three and uh, it was 7180 bis very shortly. So that'll kind of get the bulk of active active through. Uh, centralized replication can still be done. There's, you know, you can argue about which is, uh, what advantages and disadvantages are of these two approaches. Uh, I think that, what's the next slide? I think it may be kind of, okay. Also, if you want to see presentations, uh, you, can, you should read the drafts, but if you want to see slides about them, here are the most recent slides that were presented on these various different drafts. Uh, next slide. And yeah, it's all of them through RFC 7180 bis, so you want to know more about that. There's a, these slides may be a little bit out of date. The most recent version of the draft is the most important thing to read. So that's it for active active status. Sure. And the next one is the directory assisted status, which is uh, even shorter than this presentation. May I ask, do we have anyone who's, this is their first trail meeting? Good. Oh. Welcome. <laughs> okay. Uh, do not hesitate to ask questions if you don't understand or something you missed, please. So direct resistance has been going on for a while, too. We have an RSC out on the problem and a high-level design proposal. So the idea is to have push or pull directories. And these are directories of uh, information related to interfaces, like the different addresses for that interface, like the MAC address and the IP address and where it's connected to the Trill campus. So um, you can use that kind of address to optimize, to do ARP or NDE responses and optimize handling of ARP or neighbor discovery. Uh, you can, if you have a complete directory, you can eliminate unknown destination address flooding because you know all the addresses. So if you get some unknown address that's not in the directory, just toss it. Uh, and you can even use it to protect against forged source addresses because the directory contains the information about what arbitrage it's attached to and, and optionally what port it's attached to. So you get something with a source address on a port and the directory, which you assume is all knowing, says that that thing can't be connected to that port and you can toss it. So of course, if you had multiple boxes on the same port, they could forge each other's addresses and source addresses. But, um, so the push directories basically subscribe and you get all this stuff pushed to you through the Asadi protocol. And pull directories you send a query and it responds. Um, I already mentioned what the information is. Next slide. So there's a directory assistance mechanisms draft and there's a data format draft. This basically specifies a format for the uh, this directory information was sending over the wire. 
there's some drafts built on top of those, a directory assisted in CAP, which uses the directory to do a sort of pre-encapsulation in the customer equipment on the way in, but asymmetrically does decapsulation at an edge arbitrage on the way out. There's a more specific ARP optimization draft has actually been adopted, but the working group draft will be, a version will be posted next week. It is a, a working group draft. And uh, there's this other draft, which I have a separate presentation on, which is really only, these things depend on it, uh, actually the pull directory depends on this, just because this is a way to add security to those queries and responses, because uh, you would want to be able to secure your directory messages. Next slide. So uh, the channel tunnel is needed for security, and the, the IAF sub TV league is the data format, the wire format, and they're used by directory assistance mechanisms. Once you have the directory working, then you can build things on top of it, like ARP optimization or uh, directory-assisted encapsulation. So these are, the, 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 this double border means a different thing. These are not all being publication requested right now. This just means these are all working group drafts on this. Uh, and we should, I think, uh, request publication quite soon on these three at the bottom. Uh, I think a little more work is needed on these ones at the top. So the same thing, these are recent presentations if you want to see more slides. <laughs> uh, and next one, next slide, and that's it for that. So I got one more in my D sequence of three, which is to talk a little bit more about this channel tunnel thing that I said was needed to provide security for the directory messages. Uh, if, if I could sure, go ahead. Um, is anyone new from the routing area? Okay, not yet. Um, some of these um, directory assistance things are just now being suggested in the best services area. So um, the ARP optimization, there are people just beginning to think about this and these solutions may transfer between here and the, the best uh, VPN services. I think we, maybe you remember a couple of the drafts and you know the difference in the, the maturity level from this morning from mm -hmm. the, of the directory assistant or the ARP and the draft. Remember from the ARP and the draft this morning? Okay, I will explain later. Thank, Thank you. you. Next slide, yeah. So, so the idea of this, uh, there's an arbitrage channel facility which is actually uh, already out as uh, RFC 7178. So the idea is that, that in general, trill switches, our bridges need to communicate with each other in some kind of control messages. This is not the link state flooding, which is all handled by ISIS. These are separate uh, control messages. And they want to be able to do this in a multi-hop and, uh, and perhaps even multi-destination control messages. Um, so example would be BFD messages. BFD uh, is a nice standard, and it defines the BFD message, but it doesn't define any envelope. You can send BFD over whatever you want, BFD over IP, BFD over whatever. Um, so for Trill, we needed to define the Trill envelope for BFD, and that uses this arbitrage channel thing to send the BFD message. So uh, if you're sending it between arbitrages, you address the destination by the nickname, uh, or use a distribution tree if you want to send a multi-destination to flood some control message. I don't think we have any examples that do that yet. But, uh, so, because trill switches are are not guaranteed to have an, either an IP or a MAC address. I mean, they almost all do in reality. But, but you could have a, a trill switch that had only PPP interfaces, so it, it had no MAC ports, and it's theoretically perfectly valid under the trill standards, um, and uh, doesn't have to have an IP address. I think they mostly do mostly for SNMP and other purposes, but. So the control messages of this type are sent by nickname, which will always work, because if it's a trill switch, it's got to have a nickname. Um, and uh, they're in the uh, header, the Arbor Channel header, there's a field that says what, what this message is about, what the, you know, so that you can have a, kind of a sub-dispatching uh, on the message type uh, within the um, Arbor Channel message. Next slide. So, so basically you have uh, one of these messages that's got a, the link header for whatever link you have, the trill header, and there's arbitrage channel header, it's pretty short, and it starts with an ether type. There's an arbitrage channel ether type signed by IEEE, and inside that is a message type, and then there's a payload when the type of payload is, depends on the message type, and then there's the link trailer for whatever the link technology might be. So uh, that's what I've been talking about so far. Uh, we, it's also might be useful to send a control message 
between a trill switch and some end station. This would have to be a trill knowledgeable end station, some kind of a special end station that understands it might need to talk to an edge trill switch that it's connected to. So uh, you can do that with this also. Uh, and in that case, the edge device, the end station, will not have a nickname. So those are just sent with MAC address and there's no trill header. So you just send it with, uh, and currently in trill, end stations are always connected by ethernet. So you just have the, your ethernet header and trailer. And as I say, the average channel header actually starts with an ether type. So it's perfectly legitimate to just do it like this. Next slide. So what is this channel tunnel thing, this new draft? So the problem with the Arbridge Channel facility was there was no security provided. And we got a little dinged by the security area when it went through, but they weren't that, <laughs> we, we managed to get it through anyway. And for something like BFD, BFD has its own security. In the BFD payload is an authentication field and stuff like that, so it's not a problem. But that will not always be true in general, and in particular for pull directory queries and pull directory responses, you want to be able to authenticate those. So one thing that Channel Tunnel does is that as a way to add security, optionally. You, and it also, you, you can tunnel certain standardized kinds of payloads, like arbitrary channel message, or just, you can just tunnel an Ethernet frame if you want, which would be kind of odd. But um, I'll give a list of payload types in a second. And by, by using these features, you can, you can send uh, an arbitrary channel message with added security sort of nested inside this channel tunnel header. And that's intended to be used for the pull directory. Uh, next slide. So if the arbitrary channel header here says this is the channel tunnel, then there's a, just a couple little bytes which indicate what the, 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 there's security information present, what are in uh, what type of it is, and uh, what the tunneled payload type is. Uh, so it's really kind of, the tunnel, channel tunnel thing is almost like an extension to the average channel header. It's just a little thing there. Next slide. So what's changed since the January meeting? There have been two revisions. It was 02 at the January meeting, and now it's 04. So mostly security stuff was really added. There was a little security stuff there, but the only stuff that was there before was authentication. So now it has an added section for DTLS-based security. Uh, you can have pairwise key negotiation and uh, ISIS keying-based encryption and authentication. Trill can kind of uh, bootstrap off the ISIS keying if uh, there's ISIS keying configured. If you don't have any ISIS keying and don't have any ISIS security, it, it's not clear why you're worrying about other kinds of security. If somebody can completely subvert your routing system, uh, so on the other hand, if you have secured the routing system, then you already have some keys installed that you trust. So by bootstrapping off those and deriving keys, you can add sort of zero config, well, zero additional config uh, security for other kinds of things. So that's good. And th there was a scope feature, which I won't explain, but it was kind of complicated, and there were no observed requirements or needs for it. So there's still a couple reserved bytes, so it could always be added back in, but it was just taken out. Next slide. So currently, so I say this, this channel tunnel can tunnel different kinds of payloads. So currently there's a, a I think it's a, four bit, I don't know, there's, there's a payload type field. So what are these, so you can have a null payload, not a very interesting one. Uh, you can send an arbitrary channel message, you can send a trill data packet, uh, an ISIS packet, which is, so you can kind of cause an ISIS packet to, uh, to be sent to some specific arbitrage. Uh, one thing people might think that's useful for is you, if you have some link state update, and for some reason you know some remote arbitrage would be particularly interested in that link state update you could use an arbitrary channel message to tunnel it to them as a data message, which might get through a little faster than, than percolating it through the ISIS uh, mechanism. Um, and it, it could, since it's an ISIS back, it could have its own authentication inside it and stuff. And also an, an Ethernet frame. So, uh, so there's this question. So currently, you know, there's these types two, three, and four. Um, they're, they're currently defined not to start with an Ether type. So Trill has an ether type for arbitrary channel, and there is an ether type for Trill data. It's 22F3, is the hex ether type. And Trill has gotten an ether type for layer two ISIS. And these are omitted, just really to save space, kind of. But um, it's been proposed uh, to me in, uh, by uh, one of the co-authors that uh, what we should do is just collapse these to a single payload type 
and have the and that, that payload type would be starts with an ether type. <laughs> and so that way uh, you could you could indicate all of these three just by having the right ether type at the beginning. And maybe there's other things you would want to tunnel through that way and identified by ether type. Because an Ethernet frame starts with the destination MAC address, so there's no ether type at the beginning of that. But but these all have ether types. Could have ether types. So I guess uh, I'm kind of asking. Well, we could do it on the list also. But you know, uh, unless there's some objection, I think I'd like to do this because it seems like a simplification, and the two bytes doesn't seem to cost much. Yeah. I had another uh, uh, from Huawei. Yeah, I uh, have a question. If your claims uh, type two, three, and four into one, yeah. uh, you need to define a, a specific uh, incident type to differentiate from type five. Uh, no, if you can back up uh, two slides, I think. Yeah, and here. So, so. Um, if it's a channel tunnel message, I maybe I should have had another little thing down here with an arrow. The payload type, which is currently uh, zero, is reserved, and it's one, two, three, or five, okay. and then six through fifteen is reserved. Okay, you that's realize a little field um, in yeah, that's a little field in here. Uh, okay, you, you realize uh, channel type to different. Yeah, so there's a, the channel payload, uh, the then, channel tunnel payload type okay. is a field inside. This, these two bytes. As uh, so how to fill the Ethernet type? Well, oh. and then, then the, the idea is that there would be a, a type, we could say type 2 or whatever, and say that that means that the, the tunneled payload over here starts with an Ether type. And so if this, is, this field is uh, over here is a 2 or something, then you just look at the Ether type over there. Uh, I know uh, what's the Ethernet type value to for type two, three, and four, what's the there, 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 is, there, there is none. There's a there's an Ethernet there's an Ether type up here, which says arbitrary channel, and then there's a special code here that says it's channel tunnel, and then there's a code here that says there's an Ether type there. But there's only there's an Ether type there and an Ether type there. The, there's there's no this type field is a four bit field, uh, it's a it's a nibble, and um, it's currently I can say one, two, three, or five. Two, two, three, four, or five are the only defined values, and so the idea is that then, and for currently for all of them, there's no typing. The payload just sort of starts with the with the real meat without any ether type in front. And the idea would be to just take one of the values, like two, and say if this nibble over here, the tunneled payload type, a four-bit field, is a two, then what you do is you look at the First 16 bits over here to determine what type it really is. Mm, okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Uh, two forward. Uh, and I guess that, that's. I think that's it. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So the next one. So any question? We have a question. Any other questions? And uh, so I think what we need to do is resolve this question, which I think I, I tend to resolve in favor of collapsing these types because it just seems simpler and more straightforward. And uh, I can post that message on the list and see what, what if there's any reaction to that. I think it just needs a, like a little, little polishing, and then I think that the channel tunnel draft would be ready for working group last call, uh, with a, that question resolved and uh, a little polishing. Any further questions? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is uh, this is usually I'm going to present this data label based tree selection for multicast traffic. It was called a VLAN based tree selection. Uh, but later we want to be more consistent with the current RFC, which is uh, which incorporated into the data label. So we changed to the data label based. Anyway, uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, here is a little bit about the background. Currently, the uh, trio RFC says, uh, okay, the highest, the highest priority tree root, which is number one here, can announce the number of trees and uh, the ordered list of the tree nicknames. Here we assume it, it tries to announce there, uh, we can, we, we need to have four trees, which are the roots are number one to four. And each distribution tree should be pruned by VLAN. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a resulting tree structure. Uh, we have different colors to represent different trees. So we have four trees here with the different structure. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay, so what we are trying to do, what's the motivation for that? It's because uh, the, uh, the current RFC says we need to do the pruning. Uh, based on the VLAN, so for each of the trees. So if we have four trees, then we have, suppose we have the 4K VLAN here, and the total number of the entries of the multicasting forwarding table will be four times 4K, which is 16K. And uh, it is a pretty large number. Next slide, please. Uh, the table size actually is n times m entries. n is number of trees, and m is number of VLANs with downstream receivers. And we can expect there are more entries required if we want to do um, if we want to do the pruning based on the layer two or layer three multicast group address. So uh, the the is the table the table size also linearly increases with the number of trees. And we know uh, with the with current implementation, table size is pretty limited. It normally shares the 8K or 16K entry table with the IP and multicast together. So uh, we have very limited table size. So we, what we are pro propose here to do is we want to do the data label, which means a VLAN or F uh, fine grain labeling based uh, tree selection to reduce the table size. But we still allow the traffic sharing among the trees. Next slide. So the concept is, is pretty straightforward. We, we want the highest priority tree to, to announce the tree and VLAN correspondence, which is a, a pair, like a pair of the tree ID and the VLANs allowed on this particular tree ID. Then the ingress IP can only select the tree VLAN correspondence from that list which means the ingress average should not transmit VLAN X frame on tree Y if such X and Y pair value has never been announced by the highest tree, highest priority tree root. So with this, we can achieve the VLAN based load balancing by selecting uh, different trees. Next slide. Yeah, it gives, uh, take the, uh, the slide one as example, we have four trees. If we, we assign that for each of the trees, um, each of the trees should take care of 1,000 VLANs. And the multicasting uh, table entries will be like this. For the first thousand, it's tree one and uh, pruning by uh, VLAN one to 1,000. So the number of table entries can be reduced to 4K which is almost a fixed size. Next slide. Yeah, uh, this has this draft has been for a while, and we received some comments here. Uh, yeah, I'd like to give some updates from last revision. We changed from VLAN to data label according to the published IFC here, and also we uh, changed the, uh, yeah, we changed the flooding scope because the extended level one flooding, there is another IFC published for that. So we want to put the sub this into the uh, uh, extended level one flooding scope rather than the LSP. And we also we reused uh, uh, a sub uh defined in IFC 17.176 rather than define our new format for the multicast extension. It is to describe the group uh, group information and some other editorial changes. Next slide, I guess. Th that one should be the last one. So here, the next step, we, I think uh, the, the author think this is ready for call for adoption. Any questions? Oh. How many people have read this draft? Okay, um, we encourage reading this draft as we will probably take to the list very shortly a working group adoption and would like some feedback. 
Please don't hesitate to ask questions on the list. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Try to adjust this microphone. I think that'll work better. <clears throat> so you can. Um, appointed forwarder RFC uh, revision RFC. Oh, this is a is a typo. This should be RFC 6439 bis on the slide on the uh, slide here. Uh, I left this off. Okay, so uh, you can have multiple R bridges on a link, which is providing end station service. And it, it, we've, we were talking about active active earlier, which is this fancy way of doing per flow load spreading and uh, rapid failure. But in the basic control standard, uh, it uses a, a pointed forwarder to handle each VLAN. Um, so it's allocated among the different R bridges, if there's two or three or whatever on the link, based on the VLAN of the end station traffic. So the R bridge that's handling the end station traffic for any particular VLAN is called the appointed forwarder for that VLAN. Um, and the details of all this are currently in RFC 6439, which gave more details. And there's a little update in 7180. It's not too big a deal. So here's a, yeah, next slide. Yeah, good. So here's an example. So here we have three R bridges and we have a multi-access link. Now, you could have any kind of multi-access link, like uh, coaxial Ethernet with vampire taps, but that's not too common these days. So, but in the real, current world, most likely your multi-access link is a bridged LAN. And this shows a simple one with two bridges. It could be one, there could be 100 bridges, whatever. And you, know, you can have all kinds of things. You can have our, our bridges can have one port. This our bridge has two ports to the same bridged LAN, because the bridges are kind of transparent to Trill. Trill operates like above the level of bridging, although below the level of IP. So and then we have a bunch of end stations out here. And this one has multiple links. And maybe this is an MC lag between the R bridge and the bridge. Or maybe there are three parallel links that are all visible to Trill, and they're not aggregated. All these things could be possible. So and for traffic from a particular end station in some particular VLAN, in VLAN 42, one of these R bridges would be the uh, point forwarder. So there's an election to determine the designated R bridge, which is the same as kind of thing as the designated router, because it's their ISIS routers, these R bridges. Um, and uh, the designated R bridge handles all the traffic in, except to the extent that it actually appoints somebody else. So the designated R bridge is in charge, and it tells other R bridges what traffic they are supposed to handle for ingressing and egressing. Next slide. So what's the change in this RFC 39 bit? So the first is to add uh, extended level one circuit scoped uh, LSPs. So these are defined in RFC 7356, which is the flooding scope extension to ISIS. Uh, and adding this thing, what, why do you want to add this? It basically increases the space you have for link state that's local to the link. Uh, so this is link local state information. Uh, configuration advertisements from a single hello, which is pretty tight, <laughs> uh, to up to theoretically two to the 16th fragments. So it's like increases by 50,000 or 65,000 uh, the number of amount of you know you we wouldn't want to use all of that, but you do want to get a little bit more than one hello because with the current restriction, the way it's done because it's not fragmentable. When the designated R bridge appoints forwarders, all of the appointment information has to fit in one hello. It doesn't have to put it in every hello, but if it puts it in, it has to put all of it in. And there are many configurations of appointed forwarders that just can't shoehorn into the space in one hello. Um, but with this, uh, the designated R bridge can put it in the link scoped uh, FSL, the uh, extended link level one circuit scoped, rather, uh, flooding. Uh, LSPs, and that way it can get a lot more appointment information out. Uh, ISIS calls it circuit scoped, which is uh, um, next slide. So that's that's one thing. Uh, so it, what is else does this do? It also specifies some app sub TLVs you can use in this EL1 SCS, which are more efficient encodings. So currently it uses an encoding which is efficient 
for blocks of contiguous VLANs. That's ones with sequential VLAN numbers. And that's defined in RFC 7176. And you can use those wherever you want in hellos. But uh, if you have scattered VLANs that are, you know, not contiguous, uh, it's not very efficient. So the new draft defines a bitmap, which is good if you have a scattered set of VLANs that are in this narrow range. Because if they're, if they're over a very wide range, then you have lots of zero bits, and this may not be so efficient. Um, and it also defines it as a simple list, whereas the current method, you have to have like a start and an end for each one. And if, they're, if it's just a single VLAN, you make them equal to each other, but it's not a very efficient encoding. So that's that. It, uh, there was a material that I mentioned in RFC 7180, which decreases the number of different VLANs in which you in which the uh, arbitrages on the link have to send hellos. Um, uh, they, they can put more stuff in the hellos on, the design, on a special VLAN. And I don't want to go into the details, but it, it does basically it incorporates the material that's relevant to appointed forwarders that was in RFC 7180, because 7180 is being replaced, and incorporates those together with the related appointed forwarder material. And uh, when we put the RFC, uh, when you put the, the fine-grained label RFC through, RFC, RFC 7172, we got dinged by Adrian Farrell in his review a bit because he thought that the, the way the mappings between VLANs and fine-grained labels is done uh, might have problems if it was ever inconsistent. And it thought, he thought that the, since it's kind of trills basic idea to kind of be zero config and uh, automated and everything like that. There should be some automated consistency checking that the mapping between the VLAN on the link and the fine-grained label inside the Trill campus uh, and the inverse mapping should be consistent for that link. Uh, and so this adds uh, a optional way of advertising on the link. Say, oh, by the way, here's the mapping that I do. If I get any uh, input or output, any native frames, and then other our bridges on the link can see that, uh, and they can tell whether they're consistent. And of course, that would differ between ports. If different ports could go to different links, and the mappings could be different for different links. But any single link with end stations, it should be the same. So that's optionally added. So that's what's in the current draft. Next slide. <laughs> so there are two possible classes of further improvements to the draft, things that could be added to the draft, uh, one of which is uh, on port failure shutdown notification, and one is root, arbitrage, root bridge, root bridge change optimizations. So these things are both aimed at making the appointed forwarder uh, mechanism more responsive. So that in case of failures and things, you can change uh, more rapidly. I don't know how we're doing on time. Okay, so both of these things have IPR, uh, and the IPR disclosures will be posted. Um, <laughs> So, but these will be optional improvements, uh, optional uh, enhancements. Next slide. So the first one I'll talk about is this port failure thing. So the idea is that you might have an arbitrage which is planning to shut down. You know, you're going to do some maintenance on it, whatever, so you told it to shut down. And it's currently the appointed forwarder for some VLAN. Well, that VLAN traffic's got to get handled by some other one. So it would be nice if that arbitrage could tell somebody else, like the designated arbitrage that's in charge of the link, by the way, I'm going away. You should, you should tell somebody else to, you know. Um, or an arbitrage might detect that the link has failed. You know, in many cases you can detect at the physical level for certain kinds of link failures. Uh, uh, fiber has gone dark or whatever the problem. Um, and currently, uh, that sort of thing is only noticed by the other arbitrages on the link if they don't get hellos for a while. And in where it's generally three hellos, typically. So that can take many seconds to, to, not, to not get three hellos in a row. Uh, it doesn't want to be sensitive to just one dropped hello. OK, next slide. So the idea is that this arbitrage which is going down would send an arbitrage channel message to say it's going down. And um, it could serially unicast it through the rest of the Trill campus uh, if it no longer can talk to the link. Um, that typically, these are very richly connected, so there would be other paths. Uh, or if the link is still up, if the face is still up because it's like it's voluntarily shutting down, it could broadcast it on the link. You know, it's, uh, so uh, if it's sending it, whichever way it's sending it, it can always unambiguously identify which port it's talking about, saying, this port of mine is going to shut down. Uh, I can identify it by its own ISI systems ID, to identify the arbitrage, and arbitrages are required to 
number all their ports and have a unique port ID which is in all their hellos. So, and if you want to secure this, seems like a good idea. <laughs> you use the channel tunnel thing to secure these messages that say I'm shutting down. Uh, next slide. So when other arbiters get this, if, if, uh, if the uh, one that's shutting down is the designated arbitrage, then they, they basically they just drop adjacency. When they get this message, they say, I, I, I'm no longer adjacent. If that guy was the designated arbitrage, I now believe somebody else is the designated arbitrage. Uh, if, uh, I'm the, uh, if I am the designated arbitrage and that guy was appointed forwarder, then I immediately appoint somebody else as the appointed forwarder. So this, is, this can happen much more rapidly than the current timeout-based mechanism. Um, and you can do the same kinds of things. You might as well mention this if an arbitrage crashes. So it's, it's not that it, a port is going down, it's that the arbitrage just plain stopped functioning, the brain died or something. And uh, in that case, about the fastest way you learn about it is through the LSPs. All the, all the adjacencies will get dropped. And if you notice that, you can act on that anyway. So that seems that's what idea one, or what cl class of ideas one. Um, if you go to the next slide, I guess I can talk number two. So uh, root bridge changes. So uh, many points, many links these days are are point to point. Like Ethernet point to point is by far the most common kind of link. But we're talking here about uh, links that have uh, multiple R bridges on them and end stations. So they have at least three things on them and probably more. So these are probably a bridged LAN. So that means that some bridging protocol is running inside the link to uh, keep it straight. Spanning free, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so, and of course things can happen. The bridges can go up and down. The links between the bridges can go up and down. Somebody can plug in a cable to merge two bridged LANs. They can partition. You know, all kinds of fun things can happen. So, uh, and in general, one of the, if there's a topology change inside the bridge LAN like that, it takes a while for the bridging protocols to settle. And during that time, like if you plugged in two, two uh, bridge LANs together and they, they merged, you might have two different appointed forwarders for the same VLAN. And I haven't talked about that, but that's, that's bad because you can get loops and stuff. Um, and, and similarly, uh, also while the bridging protocol is settling, hellos don't get through. So the R bridges can't see each other. So the R bridges can't get their act together because they can't send hellos through because the things are being blocked by the bridge uh, protocols. This is the bridge protocols are trying to get their act together inside the LAN. So, okay, so next slide. What to do about all this? Well, the current policy is very conservative. It says so there's this thing called the common internal spanning tree, which always exists. Even if you're using shortest path bridging, there's always a common internal spanning tree. If you see that the root bridge changes, the current protocol basically says you need to inhibit your port. If you, so you get a, you get a BPDU uh, showing that the that root has changed. You need to inhibit it for a fixed length of time that's configurable. And it defaults to 30 seconds because you might have classic spanning tree running out there somewhere inside this, this bridge. So you can, you can configure it to be smaller. If you know it's all rapid spanning tree, you can configure it to seven seconds or even less if it's but, uh, and you can configure it to be zero if you want to live dangerously because you know your bridge LAN is a tree and there can't be a loop inside the bridge LAN or some other, who knows, whatever. So, uh, uh, so this inhibition is not the same as port blocking in spanning tree because it only affects native ingress and egress. It does not block fill data or ISIS. They can all still work. So anyways, um, so it turns out there are cases where you just don't need to be anywhere near that paranoid and you don't need to inhibit at all, or you don't need to inhibit it for as long. Next slide. So there's three cases, and let me just go ahead to the next slide. There's, I'll t there's one slide for each of them. I'll talk about them. So it turns out if the bridge identifier changes to a lower priority value, the only way that can happen is if a bridge or link crashed or the spanning tree partitioned. And it turns out you just don't need any inhibition in that case. You only need the inhibition for added connectivity. If you lose connectivity, that's always loop safe. Only added connectivity is loop dangerous. So in this, in this case, when the bridge identifier inside the BPDU changes to a lower priority value, you don't need to, to inhibit at all. Next slide. If the bridge identifier changes, but the bridge address of the root stays the same, the only way that can happen is if somebody just changed the configuration of the root bridge, but the topology remained the same. So if there's no change in topology, then you can't have any loops. 
Uh, so this is kind of an odd case, but if somebody just reconfigured it to uh, to change the priority, in the, but there was no topology change, you also don't need any inhibition. So both these A and B, you just don't need any don't need any inhibition at all. And one one is one more case, slide C. Um, if the changes but you can tell that the bridging protocols have settled or settled enough. Which is basically if you know you've received, if since the, the root bridge identifier changed, you've received hellos from all of your neighbors. And, and how, well, how can you tell who your neighbors are, all of your important neighbors? Well, in most cases you can see who they are because they actually report in the link state what root bridge they see, if they see any. Of course, if it's the point to point Ethernet, they don't see any root bridge because there's no bridges, no BPDUs, no nothing. But if it's a bridge LAN, they should be getting BPDUs. And so you can see which ones were connected. And um, if you get hellos from all of them, it turns out you're safe. If there were ones that you couldn't see, and then if you, if you couldn't see them before, it must be that your only path to them is through the bridge LAN, and that's loop safe. <laughs> it's only a possible loop if you could see them outside the bridge LAN as well as through the bridge LAN. So in this case, you can terminate the inhibition early as soon as you've received enough hellos. Okay, so those are three things. So um, I think that's all there is in this presentation. Right, yes. so there are these two optimizations, one of which is uh, faster alerting of other R bridges in the case of a port going down or a port that's failed, and the other is cases where you don't have to inhibit at all or can terminate the inhibition earlier. So these would be optional enhancements. If you implement these, it'll work faster and better, and you don't have to implement them. And um, they both have IPR. So. Donald, there is IPR on this one, right? Yeah, the, there's, uh, there, there'll be, I believe there'll be two IPR declarations posted. So, uh, um, any questions on these? these things. Okay. okay. So I guess I'd like to put them in the draft and post, well, I'll put a post a message on the a question on the list and put them in the draft, post the uh, declarations. The declarations will have something in them, you know, people might, looking at the declaration might make a different decision, who knows? People are welcome to comment, right? So. Thank you very much. I might mention that this, this inhibition stuff and, and these things have been a, an annoyance to a lot of people because it, it causes these seconds of delay during which you have interrupted service to end stations and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, there were two small typos. Um, we can, I mean, I think the PDF is right and people here can just bear with us. Uh, next slide. Um, so Trill over IP is intended to treat an IP network as a link connecting Trill switch ports. So basically you've got a bunch of Trill stuff over here, you've got a bunch of Trill stuff over there. You want to connect these two Trill areas over an IP network. Um, and we've got a couple scenarios in the draft for why you might want to do that. A remote office scenario and a scenario where you're connecting either a separate buildings in a campus or separate floors in a building and you've got an IP um, backbone between those things. Um, the, uh, it specifies the encapsulation, security, uh, various transport considerations including congestion, MTU, uh, et cetera. Um, so next slide. Uh, this isn't a new draft, so we're not going into all the detail of what's in it, really focusing on uh, the changes that we've made since the 01 version. Um, changes were primarily motivated by feedback that we received that the draft as it was written uh, did not really lend itself to um, using hardware support for performance. And we made a couple of changes um, in the draft to address those concerns. Uh, because obviously being able to hardware accelerate, uh, especially the security, but also the encapsulation is um, highly desirable. So 
uh, security, we, we had been using DTLS for security and we've changed it to use IP security uh, because there's better hardware support for IPsec including uh, uh, boxes that do the IPsec um, uh, tunnel, you know, the endpoint um, outside of the actual uh, switch itself and hardware accelerated IPsec stuff and so um, that was changed in version 2. We also received feedback that the encapsulation we were using, that it would be better if we used a VXLAN compatible encapsulation uh, because that has better hardware support and um, we are working on an encapsulation for that and we'll talk about um, what we think that's going to look like in the slides. Uh, and we also made some other uh, changes. Next slide. Um, security, uh, the draft now specifies IPsec ESP, uh, which is the tunnel, you know, the tunnel mode IPsec. Uh, we still need to fill in some details about uh, the mandatory to implement crypto algorithms and key and key negotiation. We just want to get some advice from the right people so we put the right stuff in there and uh, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, it's not actually that important to how this conceptually works. Um, they're kind of the, the details that need to be filled in uh, to do the mandatory to implement stuff. Um, we use uh, ESP tunnel mode uh, because IPsec compliances and uh, offload hardware support that. So you'll see um, on one side you might have uh, the R bridge actually doing IP security within the R bridge if it had hardware support for that. goes over the IP routing backbone. On the other side they might be using a separate appliance to do the IPsec stuff, terminating the tunnel there and going to the R bridge. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, it's actually very similar to the DTLS slide we used to have in a lot of ways. But you know, you've got, there's the trill over IP, um, uh, I don't know, without security. Uh, IP header, the trill over IP encapsulation, which includes UDP uh, and the trill data. Over here we end up with the IP header, the IPsec ESP, so all of that is encrypted inside here, the IP header, uh, the UDP encapsulation, and the uh, the payload. Um, next slide. So um, going on to encapsulation type, the current draft uh, is actually not, it, its name uh, predates the inclusion of UDP. It's really a trill over UDP IP encapsulation, not just over IP. Uh, but we've been told there's fast, better fast path hardware support uh, for encapsulation such as VXLAN. And We've worked on a VXLAN encapsulation for this. Um, so the VXLAN encapsulation, uh, we're going to use the current VXLAN, our C7348. And what it ends up being is Trill over Ethernet over VXLAN over UDP IP. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Trill data versus the ISIS is indicated by the Ether type in that Ethernet header, the one right below Trill. The rest of that Ethernet header is basically the source and destination address are wasted space because they're not actually used for anything uh, in the Trill protocol. But this is how you do a VXLAN encapsulation, uh, as far as we can tell. <laughs> other encapsulations could be developed um, or are being developed in other working groups, but right now we don't have any proposal to include them in this spec. So the next slide. Uh, this is what the encapsulation will look like. Uh, the UDP encapsulation is over there more for reference IP, UDP, Trill data. Fairly simple but not very hardware acceleratable. And then we've got over here the IP header, the UDP header, the VXLAN header, an Ethernet header, and then the Trill data. And that this Ethernet header is used to say is it Trill or ISIS and up here in the UDP header, the source port provides entropy so that for load balancing and things like that. So next slide. Um, our plan right now is that the initial mode for Trill over IP would be to exchange the hellos and LSPs and whatnot using the UDP encapsulation, the simple one, the one that you would want to use if you don't actually have VXLAN hardware acceleration or boxes on your system. And then, then we would do a negotiation to determine um, what other encapsulations the, the boxes support and what priority order they want to use them in 
and there would be a method to pick the one that was the highest priority. Um, the adjacency between trill switches would only be established if two of them are w willing to support the same encapsulation. So they could actually refuse to support UDP encapsulation for ongoing communication if they want to. It would just be the initial exchange that has to go over UDP. Um, and then you could also allow the boxes to be configured to, you know, hard to find that they will only use one encapsulation, right? If you wanted to all use VXLAN, you could configure them all to use VXLAN. The initial packets would go over UDP. They'd both say they do VXLAN as their only one. It would get picked and you'd be VXLAN happy. So there'd be very little traffic that isn't using whatever encapsulation it was that you had configured the boxes to use. The original one was the IP Well, it, it depends whether or not you have the security turned on. So it's UDP IP or it's UDP with the IPsec ESP inside of it. VXLAN. Right, and you could do VXLAN with the um, IPsec ESP stuff inside of it too, and, unless I mean, I, there's not any reason you can't, right? I mean, yeah. So next uh, slide. And other work remaining includes, we have a QS, QoS considerations section and there's the trill packet priority and we just have to say how we map that to the IPTOS bits and we've just been too lazy to do that yet. Uh, I, I don't know that there's any, I mean, we can argue about it later once we've proposed something but I don't know that it's actually that difficult. And then there's also a middle box consideration section which I think is going to require a, a quite a bit more thought. Um, and it may end up being that, you know, this uh, doesn't work through all types of middle boxes, but we have to go through them all and figure out uh, what we can actually say about middle box considerations. And uh, that is the next slide. I think that's pretty much it for the talk. Yeah, feedback or questions from anybody? And um, I mean, we obviously aren't ready to go to working group last call or anything. We have unfilled in sections. So we're just looking for feedback at this point. Uh, we go from Huawei. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you have two uh, trio OOP encapsulations. Uh, the first one is trio in UDP. The second is trio over VXLAN. Uh, I want to know if the first encapsulation only support a P2P type uh, 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 link. Uh, I know uh, trio over VXLAN uh, supports uh, both uh, P2P and the, and the broadcast link type. Yeah, I, I want to know, I want, I'm wondering if the first one only support the P2P type. Um, no, I, I, I mean, the first off, I don't know, I mean, we're putting the VXLAN encapsulation in and, uh, you know, it isn't fully specified yet, so I do believe it'll support both point-to-point um, -point and broadcast, but I also think the UDP one will, so I'm not sure why why you would think it, it wouldn't. Yeah, Donald, yeah. is there something? Yeah, I, or an IP broadcast packet, IP right? I, I don't, I. Yeah, for uh, broadcast link, you uh, true is over uh, multicast uh, IP header, yeah. Well, it's for uh, UDP IP, right? Uh, and it could be over anything IP runs over, but let's say it's over Ethernet, which is a broadcast media. There's no reason it couldn't be a broadcast. I mean, if it was over a point-to-point -point link, it would be point-to-point, -point, right? I mean, I, that's kind of a, a, a IP can support broadcast over any any network type that supports broadcast, right? So, uh, 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 my meaning is uh, for uh, DCI network, yeah. It, it is uh, it is uh, uh, similar to normal link between <coughs> upbridges. The the IP network, yeah, is similar to normal uh, uh, Ethernet link between upbridges. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <coughs> how to simulate uh, a broadcast link uh, using uh, the IP uh, using the IP header to simulate uh, normal broadcast link. I think it is you, easy you'd to, use an IP to simulate P2P link. I mean, you'd use an IP multicast packet <laughs> when you wanted it to use a Ethernet level multicast packet. I think for VXLAN, it is, uh, it is very easy to simulate both P2P and... Uh, well, because then you have Ethernet and you're going to... But, I mean, 
You're still going to so have the I UDPIP in there that has to use a multi. I mean, so, so that, I don't that, understand why they're that, different that, in this regard. We, that's one reason why we added this section six on port configuration. So, like by default, the ports just kind of do an obvious thing and use some kind of uh, IP multicast group, and it's going to allocate some. But so, um, so like typically hellos, you typically multicast because you're looking for whatever the hell is out there and see if it might send a hello back to you. But if you want to, you can configure a port with a list of unicast addresses, and you know it just when it wants to send a broadcast, it would just send it to those unicast addresses or a single unicast address. You can restrict it so that everything. So that's part of the port configuration. The default is very general and tends to blast the stuff out with using IP multicast, but you can restrict it as much as you want. Have we already defined an all R bridges IP multicast address? No, we only have an all R bridges MAC address. Because we probably but, want to define an all. No, but the draft does request an IEN allocation for both an IPv4 and an IPv6 uh, multicast address. Right. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Is did yeah. we? Uh, is that in there? It's in there, but it yeah. hasn't been allocated yet. Right. So you could use that to reach all our yeah. bridges, or you could use a unicast list. But I mean, you'd use the unicast list when when you wanted to control yeah. um, what I mean, it, what other boxes you consider our bridges. Right. Or, or or the case where the multicast list isn't supported because these, yeah. these yeah. two things are randomly on the global internet and the global internet doesn't do so right. good for most IP multicast right. these days. Right. <laughs> no. In the remote office space you're probably going to be talking about a point-to-point -point link where that yeah. list contains one node yeah. uh, regardless of whether the media supports multicast or not because you actually are trying to go out to that node and make it a remote office. You're not trying to ask the universe to be a remote office, right? It's a, it's a tunnel. Right. Right. And, but I think what you're asking, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is you want to know if multicast versus unicast behavior, if we encapsulate with VXLAN, is different if we just use UDP. Is that what you're asking? Uh, it seems like you're asking, if, is there a difference between the behavior of VXLAN when it comes to multicast in this scenario versus the behavior of multicast with just the UDP encapsulation? Are you asking what, if there's a difference between the two? Uh, I, I just want to know. Uh, I, I, I think the second uh, encapsulation uh, uh, is easy to be implemented. Yeah. Uh, 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 how to say? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the. A uh, neighbor's uh, relationship is uh, is uh, very similar to uh, normal uh, uh, normal uh, trio protocol. The second uh, the encapsulation. The first one uh, uh, broadcast and point to point link is uh, uh, um, Representation is uh, very different from uh, normal um, uh, uh, normal averages <laughs> uh, to best protocol. Uh, uh, yeah, I, maybe I. Uh, well, uh, I, we don't want to frustrate you, so why don't you think about it a little more and post a question to the list, and we'll we'll do our best to cover it. I mean, if you, if you have a real concern, we want to cover it, so we don't want to frustrate you, you know, with you know terminology or anything. But you know, you want to take it to the list and we'll discuss it. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Maybe you could explain on the list what what the differences are you see between these that are pertinent to um, mul you know point to point versus multicast. Well, why <coughs> why why do you think it would be easier in this one than that one? And then if we agree with you, we can agree with you. And if we don't agree with you, we can try to explain to you why we think it's different. Any uh, further questions, comments? <coughs> examples of the scenarios? Oh, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, yeah, we could do that.
So, next slide. So, I, I managed to actually get a very early partial draft, <laughs> a zero to zero draft posted just before the meeting on link security. So, uh, the, the graph, draft does not accomplish this yet, but what its goals are, are to establish uh, a strong security policy and the defaults for Trill link security, which I, I mean security on links between our bridges, like one hop, one Trill hop. And to specify how to do link security more precisely, provide better defaults for the existing link types. So existing link types are Ethernet, a very common, popular link type, <laughs> uh, which is covered in the base protocol spec, PPP and pseudowire. So those draft, those RFCs all say something about link security, but not a whole lot. Um, so that's the, these two are things are the goals. Next slide. So what are these new policies? So I propose to have a policy that if you're doing trill communication between trill switch ports, and those ports support encryption and authentication at line speed, they, which usually requires hardware, but, uh, but who knows. Um, if that's available, then it must default to being using security. That was the proposal. Uh, secondly, if the switch ports that are being connected do not support security at line speed, then it doesn't have to be the default, because you know, if you can't support it at line speed, it means you're going to decrease the data rate and or saturate your CPU or do something bad. But it may still be cases where you want to do it, even though you can't do it at line rate. So I think the current draft says you must implement it and make it available, but it doesn't have to be the default if you can't do it at line rate. That could be a should, I'm not to Dr. Nair. And the last point is that if you can't authenticate, because you don't actually have keys established, or whatever, then you should still use security, but use opportunistic security, unauthenticated encryption. Um, so, um, and it also, as so was the policy part, the other part was link stuff. So, what about the link type? So, for Ethernet, it specifies just basically use the IEEE standard. Uh, 802.1 AE, there's a bunch of amendments which mostly add crypto algorithms and things. Um, and it, uh, it needs to provide profiling so it tells you which crypto algorithm is required to implement because there's several and how to do default keying and stuff like that. For PPP, uh, so this draft is very incomplete so I don't claim it necessarily does all these but this is supposed to do. PPP, true PPP over HDLC links not real common. <laughs> but if you did have one of those, then you kind of have to use the PPP security, which is very old, does not meet current standards. It's basically pretty crappy. But if that's all you have, then you should do the best you can with that. And draft might as well say what to do. In most cases, PPP is running over something else, like PPP over Ethernet. In that case, you just want to use Ethernet security. You want to use a, a lower level that's some substrate that has better, more modern security. Pseudo wires have no security, so but they're always carried over something, so you know they're carried by um, IP or whatever, and in that case you use the lower level security. So there is the IP link type, but that's a separate draft which we're working on right now. So there's no reason for this link security draft, particularly to cover that. It it mentions IP, but it just says that should be covered in the IP over the trill over IP draft. So this is to kind of catch up for the old. Uh, link types that weren't really covered properly. Next slide. So here's this sort of diagram. So we have end stations, and you can have end station to end station security, which could, MaxSec would be a good choice, but you could do something else. But whatever it is you do, it's actually out of scope for Trill. I mean, a couple of the Trill documents say you should always think about using end station to end station security. I mean, it doesn't matter how, well, except for traffic uh, statistics and stuff, it doesn't matter so much how things are compromised in the middle, at least your content will be safe. And there's also the edge, the trill to the end station to edge at each end, which is also out of scope for trill. But that you might <laughs> want to do that as well. But this this thing is basically about that, that's a very secure way to display the slide. It's hard to <laughs> I like, I like the <laughs> Okay. Is it the two screen problems or something? Or? I, I don't think that's the projector coming up with that nice image. Yeah, no, it's weird. Yeah, I appear to not be 
PowerPoint quit, you say? What? Or whatever. That's my story. Okay. Well, I've had PowerPoint quit on me. Okay, so we should get back to the slide we were on. Oh, back one. There you go. So, so this draft is primarily concerned with these links between our bridges. In this case, we happen to have a PPP link here, an Ethernet link here, and a pseudo wire link here. So, how to secure those things? That's the main topic of the current draft. Just to kind of give an example. Uh, next slide. So on Ethernet security, just a little bit more. So MaxSec using this between our bridges is very straightforward with the most common point-to-point -point link because you just do it. It's point-to-point. -point. But if you, and you could have tunneling things in between, like this point-to-point -point link could really be carrier Ethernet or something. It could be all kinds of junk in the middle as long as it's transparent. But if you have a customer bridge in the middle, for some reason between these two R bridges, you have a bridged LAN with customer bridges, then the way MaxSec works, it's defined to work to the next bridge port. So if you do that, you either have to get these, get the right keying to the bridges, and, or you, and you, have to, uh, you have to get the keying to the bridges, and you have to kind of trust them. But the, so it just needs to talk about that in the draft. It's not a, too big a deal. Um, and I say I mentioned that the draft also does, even though it's out of scope for Trill, it does talk a little bit about end station to end station and end station to edge MaxSec, because it might be confusing for people. And if you really want to, you can use MaxSec end to end and MaxSec from the end to the edge uh, and MaxSec between our bridges in the middle. And, you, you know, there are sort of different levels in the, inside the, the packet that wants to sort of show you how you can do that sort of stuff. Uh, next slide. So we could add edge to edge security from the ingress trill switch to the egress trill switch to this draft. It's not in there currently. Uh, and there are possible, there's possible ways of doing that. So the most obvious thing would be to use MaxSec essentially inside the trill header. So I think that would be a good thing. So this is just a personal draft, and I'm not, I'm not asking for it to be adopted because it's vastly incomplete and I'm working. But I thought I would just show this to people in case people are interested and had feedback in which direction, and I'll probably add this edge-to-edge -edge security to it. Uh, from a personal point of view, I agree. Yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. I think that's it. Oh, yeah, so I uh, propose action, work on the draft. <laughs> Questions about this uh, new upcoming draft? The one thing to keep in mind is that with all the rhetoric and politics and press that's going on right now about security, bringing this sort of feature into Trill might actually, you know, create a, a good opportunity for people to actually end up with a slightly more secure environment. So this could actually not only help you know us and, and everyone else, but could really help a lot of end users as far as their you know their fear and their concerns about uh, security. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ming Zhang from Huawei. In this draft, we specify the solution for trio multi-level. In doing trio multi-level, the whole trio network will be split into multiple L1 areas. These L1 areas will be connected by the level 2. So why do we need trio multi-level? With Trio multi-level, each upbridge can maintain a smaller link database, link state database, and has less control traffic, and also have fewer topology changes. The second reason is that the optimized routing computation overhead can be greatly reduced. Last but last but not least, we we can specify solutions to allow nicknames to be reused in different areas. Next slide. The major issue that, ha that has to be handled in trail multi-level is uh, how to manage average nicknames. There are three possible solutions. The first solution is to 
give Abridges unique nicknames in all areas, across all areas. The second nickname is to aggregate nicknames. The method is like this. You need assign nicknames independently in each L1 area. While in L2, each L1 area will be repre represented with a single nickname. And this nickname has a single one, a single one nickname. The, this document specifies the third solution. In this solution, the board average just use a single border upgrade nickname for both L1 and L2. While well, for the non-border upgrades in each L1 area, the nicknames are assigned independently, just like the aggregated nickname solution. While well, in L2, each L1 area will be represented with a list of border upgrade nicknames. Next slide. In these slides, we show three examples on the three solutions. The first example is on unique nickname method. You can see from the figure, all the abridges get a unique nickname, abridge one through abridge eight. The second example is on aggregated nicknames. In this, method, in this example, abridges in each L1 area assign the nicknames independently. Here, it independently means different averages in different areas can have the same nickname. While in L2, the L1 area will be represented with a single average, and this average has a single nickname. The third example is on single border nickname solution. In this solution, the L1 area will be represented with a list of nicknames. You may wonder how this solution will work. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. The first thing for this solution is about area discovery. In the L1 area, all, all board averages will discover each other through the L1 FP exchanging. While in L2, the lists of border average nicknames will be exchanged through the L2 LP exchanging. So in L2, each average will get, get to know all other border averages for each area. Next slide. Now let's check how a unicast packet is forwarded across areas. Suppose the average 27 in the L1 area knows the MAC address D is attached to the area that the average 7 is attached to. So it will fill the nickname of RB3 into the egress nickname field and set the ingress nickname to RB27 and send it out. Then the packet arrives at RB2. RB2 will replace the ingress nickname to its own nickname, that is RB2. Since RB2 already knows that RB3 and RB30 are both connected to the <coughs> L1 area as the border average, so it can determine to use either RB3 or RB30 as the egress nickname. Then the packet is sent to RB3. And RB3, the, the, MAC uh, the MAC address will be looked up in the MAC table. And RB3 found that this MAC address is attached to RB44. So it replaced the egress nickname to RB44. Since RB3 knows RB2 and RB20 are both attached to the L1 area as the border average. It can determine to replace the ingress nickname to either RB2 or RB20. By careful design of the nickname replacing method, 
our bridges can actually achieve a certain load balance. Next slide. Note that the address of the two data packet is actually the inner MAC address and the, the inner VLAN or five green label. This address never changes from the initial ingress up bridge to the final egress up bridge. The change in egress and the egress nickname and board upgrades is a little like label swapping in MPS. Next slide. Since the return traffic may go through any border upgrades, all of them need to learn the MAC address. The border upgrades can synchronize the MAC learning using the L1 ESAD protocol. Next slide. Now let's see how the multicast forwarding works in this solution. For this solution, our bridges in each area need to compute the distribution trees separately. So for this figure, we have three trees. Tree one and tree three are in L1 areas, and tree two is in L2. Now suppose that RB27 is the ingress up bridge. It will compose the trio debt packet. It will set, as defined in the trio protocol, the egress up bridge nickname is the root up bridge nickname of the tree. So RB27 will fill in this field to the root up bridge nickname, say RB27. And uh, it, set, it sets the ingress nickname to RB27. Then forward this packet out. The packet will arrive at uh, RB2 and RB20. RB2 will do the transition between L1 and uh, L2. It will change the egress nickname to the root average nickname of the O tree two, say is RB two. While the ingress nickname will be replaced to RB two's own nickname. And RB twenty, since RB twenty is not the designated border average, it has to drop this packet to avoid duplication. Now the packet will send out along the level two tree. Finally, it arrives at uh, RB3 and uh, RB30. And RB3, the e egress nickname will be replaced again with a new tree root's nickname. It is RB44. Uh, similar as it does in the unicast forwarding, RB3 can determine to replace the ingress nickname to either RB2 or RB20. Well, and RB30, the packet must be dropped to avoid duplication, since RB30 is not the designated average. The rule for the designating of border average is, is like this. Um, all the border average is run a pseudo random algorithm to determine a single DBRB. Next slide. When a multicast packet reaches its destination area, this packet should not be should not exit from this area. Otherwise, forwarding loops will happen. So the board average can check the ingress nickname field of the data packet. If it found that, finds that the ingress nickname is actually an L1, uh, an L2 border average nickname, it must drop this packet. We can call this a multicast scooping. Next slide. This slide des uh, describes a corner case. If one border average is connected to multiple areas, 
This board average should obtain multiple nicknames with one border average nickname per area. Next slide. Advantages of this solution are listed as follows. The first advantage is that it requires fewer nicknames. Second, it requires less configuration and, less and offers less ability to screw up the configuration. Third, since each board average uses its own nickname, it avoids the reverse path forwarding check issue. Last but not least, it offers adequate path split on multiple trees. Next slide. Okay, please read the draft and comment. That's it. Thank you. Hi, we go. Uh, um, I have uh, uh, a doubt. Uh, uh, for the traffic, uh, then across different areas mm. on the as uh, on the border bridge. Uh, I'm wondering uh, uh, if the trail encapsulation needed to be terminated. Which means uh, uh, Mac table. Uh, I want to know uh, if Mac table uh, looking up is needed, or only nickname uh, switching. Uh, it depends. Can you show the figures on the unicast forwarding? Go bang, bang, bang. Yes, this one. When the packet is sent out, it arrives at RB2. And RB2, it only needs to replace the ingress nickname. It needs not to look up the MAC table. Uh, but, but when it arrives at RB3, RB3 has to look up the destination MAC address in its MAC label. So the answer to your question depends. Uh, but how uh, RB2 uh, known uh, the nickname uh, belongs to uh, border uh, belongs to a, 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 yeah, area on the right. It, it, I, I want <laughs> because uh, different area have overlapped uh, nickname. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to know RB2. Uh, how RB2 knows uh, the destination uh, nickname belongs to uh, which area? Mm -hmm. Here, RB27 knows. Mm, RB3 is the destination average or the egress average. Yeah, how RB2 knows that yeah, the that destination that is RB2, RB2, RB3? Yes, because before this action, RB3 had sent a traffic, sent a data traffic to RB27. So RB27 can learn the destination average. Nickname. Uh, you mean, uh, okay. You mean uh, RB27's MAC table uh, matings the egress nickname is RB3. Yes, uh, not that's real, right. Not a real uh, egress nickname of RB44. Uh, of course. Uh, okay, okay. And thank you. Yeah, I usually I have a follow up question for this. So in that case it's possible that you just now you said why the IB twenty seven knows it should send the packet to IB three. It is because uh before that there are some traffic in the reverse direction we re mm -hmm. received, right? So yes. it's possible that sometimes it received from IB three, sometimes it received from IB thirty thirty. So it's possible? Yeah, it's possible. So that means the RB27 is sometimes is sent to uh, number, sorry, RB3 and sometimes sent RB30. <coughs> so it's intention, intentionally to be designed like this. Yeah. Um, is, is, a fl is there a flip-flop thing? Yes, I know what you mean. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it's possible that the traffic is sent from RB30, uh -huh. but RB2 knows RB3 and uh, RB30 are both connected to this area. <laughs> it can determine to send to RB3 or RB30. It, it can do the nickname replacing and, and uh, RB2. So even uh, RB27 learned that 
this traffic should be destined to RB3. It can change its nickname to RB30 and send it to RB30. You mean the decision actually is made by the border operators? <laughs> it can do. It can. It can try to forward the traffic to whatever. Yeah. The other side border operator as he likes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one more clarifying <laughs> question. The next slide, I think, is number nine. The multicast. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I, I I guess the uh, light lighting there means the. Block. Yeah, it's a blocked link, right? So what if there is say for for example the average sorry, my my eyes thirty. 30. I mean the right hand side, average thirty, there is another average like let's say five connecting to average average thirty in the left uh, right hand side. So in that case actually you cannot block that link, right? Because the can, can you block that link? If there is one more upbridge connecting to upbridge 30 at the right hand side, right. So if in that, yeah. So um, how to say? No, the right hand side. Right hand side. There is another link. Another link here. It should block all the links to this area. Um. We we. Uh, if if it blocks that particular link, then within that particular area, it, it, that would be reachable for for the it's yeah. If there is one more upbridge, I mean. One more. Since this is a yeah, this. Not before it's a tree root for four or forty four. This is a tree. I it I kind of arrives and any upbridge. Right. Uh, the right hand side, the circle itself is a tree, right? Uh -huh. It is yes. a tree. It's a, it is a the tree. root is 40, 44? Yes. 44. Yes. We suppose okay. it is 44. So what if uh, there is a RB5 connecting to RB30? Then this RB5 also belonging to the right hand side circle. So in order for the RB5 to connect to the root tree root, 44. It has go. It has to be go through 30 to 44. Mm -hmm. So that particular link cannot be blocked, right? The, the, the idea is that there's an RB. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, so the idea is so this is a, a fully connected tree over here. Right. So if there's an RB5 in here, here's a little RB5. Connecting to 30. If it connects to 30, it better connect to something else. If it connects only to 30, right. then it's a separate area. <laughs> if it's part of the tree, it connects other ways, ways too. I mean, yeah. Uh, in your solution, uh, a data plan machine learning is used. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, control plan machine learning uh, is used, a uh, uh, study should be uh, running uh, on each area. Uh, uh, in, your, uh, <coughs> in this figure, uh, three is studying uh, should be uh, run. Yes. Yeah, and the um, on the border average, uh, 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 the study of two domains uh, should be uh, uh, trans uh, translated to change the source nickname to change the ingress nickname. You mean you use Isadi to change the nickname? No. Yeah. Uh, uh, Isadi yeah. just used to synchronize uh, the MAC addresses. Yeah. For uh, uh, for the Isadi run uh, on RP2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the left hand uh, uh, Isadi uh, flooding the nickname uh, uh, the real nickname uh, uh, associated with uh, which uh, uh, end stations. And mm -hmm. the RB2 should change the ingress nickname to its own nickname uh, to RB3. Yeah. So, uh, no. I, I, you saw the address. The, the, the information inside is RB. Mm -hmm. should change nicknames. Yeah. That's a good point. I think the Isadi should be scoop, uh, scooped in the areas. 
shall not cross areas. I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe you can define the rule study, to uh, but for prohibit the, study the on the uh, running on the border bridges, uh -huh. the is uh, the uh, study uh, 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 translation uh, a nickname translate uh, uh, English nickname uh, 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 transformation should be performed uh, to mm. let the egress. Uh, RB uh, to learn uh, uh, to learn uh, the Mac associated with the border RB, not uh, associated with the real English RB. I think an RB2, it can do some translation. After it learns the Mac address from the ISADI and a level 2, yeah. it can then do the level 1 ISADI to notify RB22. It it can prohibit the direct transition from L2 to L1. Yeah, uh, but from the level, uh, level, uh, level 1 to level 2, how to, trans uh, how to translate it? Uh, since RB2 can, can also record the MAC address it learns from level, two, uh, level 1, yeah. it can use the level 2 study to yeah. distribute these learned MAC addresses. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, you, uh, and, uh, yeah, at this time, the, the nickname is the Bod RB itself, not the, uh, uh, not the real English nickname. Of course, in order to win yeah, that, yes. we, we need it to be the Bod nickname, uh, uh, yeah. not I, the real nickname in L, L1. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, this point can better be clarified in your draft. Yeah, I can. And then section about the study. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I have a very odd question. Uh -huh. so if it doesn't make sense, I can take it offline. Okay. This this design works very nicely with Isadi. Um Have you ever thought about this design, this multi-level design, where PGP carries the MAC addresses? Okay, I haven't thought that. that. That's why I said, very uh -huh. odd question, but there are other, uh, there are lots of MAC address carrying in BGP. And uh -huh. It seems to me this design would work okay. if the MAC addresses, but it's a, like I say, it's enough. Okay, I will thought about that, think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Thank you so much for the presentation. It's very Thank you very much. This is the first of the um, multi-level discussions. Um, so uh, I encourage you to look into it. We will pick up some more. If you have an idea on this, please um, create a draft, start to work on it. And let me add that, that part of what's driving this is that there's a lot of implementations in the field that have scaling limitations. And so to grow those environments bigger, something like this is required. And so if we don't do this, there's going to be proprietary solutions for it, which isn't going to help you any. And my question about the BGP Mac edition is that um, other solutions for forwarding uh, glue their layers together with BGP. There's a lot of BGP Mac distribution. Uh, Trill is superior in many of the other presentations, I just was, it was a thought question that's we're different. We use this on okay? And I just want to add one point. Uh, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but the slide quality for this session was significantly improved. Easier <laughs> to read, better colors, better fonts. It looks much professional. I really, I really cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. It really helps the chairs. Thank you so much. Do we have another one? I think if any other questions or things to raise on the list, we, you may see um, more, you may see an interim schedule if we have more management or stuff we have to ask questions, it will probably be a short one, but right now we think we're moving pretty good through things. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. And please make sure that you sign the blue sheet if you haven't already. See you in Prague.
schedules and the blue sheets and the notes and the gold sheets. Just going to be working with production for this. I think we did that. And the trees were far enough along that. I did this one. Oh, wait. A couple of years ago. And so basically, there's a, there's a tool, he's going to send me a what a, a, a link of, an email of links, but one of the links is to a kind of a reviewer site link page that he has. So I don't want to email. It doesn't send out email or anything, but it gives a lot of text. Yep. Yes, 